paying your taxes can save our democracy. Now, you might be wondering why I'm talking about this, because, of course, I'm not a municipal finance expert. I'm an urban planner. I've spent a tremendous amount of time planning this city, working in cities across Canada, working in cities across the world. And one of the things that I've learned in this work is that our shared interests materialize in our cities. When we get our cities right, oh, they become places of tremendous opportunity, places of inclusion. When we get our cities right, they become places where within just one generation, newcomers can become firmly established as a part of the middle class. I know this in part because this is my story. My grandparents came to Canada from Holland after the Second World War with pretty much nothing more than the shirts on their backs. I believe that the biggest challenges we face in the world today, fear of one another, random violence, growing exclusion and inequality, will be overcome by identifying and building our cities based on our shared interests. Now, I started out talking about taxes and democracy. Well, taxes and democracy are the way that we come together. Taxes and democracy are the way that we materialize our shared interests. But I'm worried. I'm worried because I think we've lost the thread. What are our shared interests? Well, in Canada, we recognize health care as a shared interest. We can all pretty much agree. We all do better when everyone has access to health care when they're sick. That's a shared interest. We recognize education as a shared interest. We pay for education. We subsidize education because we believe that education is something that matters to everyone. In our cities, particularly our dense urban cities, we see transit as a shared interest. We know it's better for the environment. We know that it's a much less costly way to move around. And we know that people need access to jobs and educational opportunities. And having a comprehensive transit system is a way to get there. So we see transit as a shared interest in our cities. Now, there's some other things we see as shared interests as well. Libraries. Libraries are good for everyone, so we pay for them together. Access to nature, access to parks. We pay for these things together because we see them as shared interests. These are the things that everyone needs in order for our society to work. Societies flourish when we recognize our shared interests, and we've even go gone so far as to organize our lives around them. We've organized ourselves as a democracy because we recognize that the democracy is a way to deliver on our shared interests. But I've suggested to you that I think we've lost the thread. We've lost the narrative of our democracy. Nothing makes this more apparent than fake news. Fake news isn't about our shared interest. Fake news isn't about us working as a society collectively to find truth, to build understanding. No, fake news is about something else. Fake news is actually about someone thinking about their own interest and how they can manipulate the way people think based on that interest. But the thing is, our shared interests are so important today because we are experiencing what some might call our final, last wave 
of human migration. Mass urbanization began during the French Revolution, it continued through the Industrial Revolution, and it resulted in a spectacular upheaval of politics and social structures. This is over 200 years ago, and I would argue that we're in the last phase of this epoch. We're in the last phase of people across the globe moving from ag ag agrarian societies into fundamentally urban ones. As this is happening, our cities are becoming places of great wealth and great poverty. You know, my city, the city of Toronto, is widely recognized as a wonderful city to live on pretty much any international indice. The Economic Intelligence Unit every year comes out with a list of most livable cities in the world. We're always in the top five. We can pretty much guarantee to be in the top five all the time. But did you know Toronto is also known as the child poverty capital of Canada? Did you know that one in four children in this city lives below the poverty line. In 15 neighborhoods in this city, more than 40% of the children live in poverty. So we have mass urbanization. We have growing poverty and growing wealth taking place in the exact same geography. And at the same time as all of this is happening, we are having an active debate about whether or not we should pay our taxes. If we no longer want to pay our taxes, we no longer want to share. And if we no longer want to share, our democracy is at risk. A perfect example of this is housing. Housing is a human right. Following the Second World War, 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was created, and it included housing. Access to safe, stable housing was identified as a universal human right, something that every person on this planet is entitled to. And yet, we no longer build affordable housing. Over the last 30 years, we've left housing to the market. We've essentially left housing, a universal human right, something that every individual on this planet requires as a baseline. We've left the provision of housing to chance the commodification of housing in our lifetimes, during my adult life, the commodification of housing has created a housing crisis. Over the past 50 years, wages have increased across the globe by approximately 150 percent. But housing? Housing prices have quadrupled. Housing has increased in cost by 450 percent. And you might think I'm talking about Toronto. You might think I'm talking about Vancouver. I'm not. I'm talking about all the greatest cities on this planet, from Hong Kong to Sydney to Stockholm to Singapore to New York to Paris to London, to the places where we live in the 21st century. Housing has become commodified. And the outcome of that is a housing crisis. The Great Recession of 2008 in America, sure, it was a financial crisis. But it was more so a housing crisis. Nine million people over five years were evicted from their homes. And their homes, sat empty while they scrounged for somewhere to go, a, co a couch to lie on, 
a shelter that might take them in. Their homes sat empty while they had nowhere to go. We need to ask ourselves, what is a house? Is a house an asset to be bought and sold? Is a house a stable place to park excess capital? Or is a house a place to nourish human life? Is a house a place with a kitchen table where children come home to do their homework before they watch a bit of TV and read a story and go to bed? Are houses homes for the raising of children, places of stability and security in old age? If we have a shared interest in housing, the commodification of it, does that serve our shared interests? Hey, let's be clear. If you own a house, you are entitled to snow plowing. If you own a house, the odds are you're on a street, the snow is going to get plowed when it snows. Oh, and garbage pickup, you're entitled to that too. You're entitled to have your garbage picked up. But if you don't have a house, well, you're not actually entitled to that. That's not something we share. If we believe in sharing, we need to fundamentally rethink housing not just in my city or in your city, but across this entire globe. The vision. The vision is housing that is geared to income in such a way that it's stable. You don't have to worry. You don't have to spend your life worrying that you might get kicked out. It's also accessible. You can afford to pay it throughout your entire lifetime. There's no other premise that can underpin 21st century democracy more critically than that of sharing. On a global stage right now, we're having a really big fight. We're having a big fight about who's in and who's out. We're having a fight about who belongs where and how we provide housing in our cities will determine whether those most in need of shelter will simply be shunted from place to place, chased away by famine or fire or political unrest, often from one place to the next, from one nation to the next, unable to find a place where they belong, told that they're a burden, that they cost too much, that they'll be a drain on our, on our economy and our pocketbooks. This is, in fact, my story. Both of my grandfathers were re resistance fighters, fighting the Nazis in Holland in the Second World War. They lost everything during the war. Their country was devastated. They moved to Canada with a tremendous amount of hope. And they got here and they worked hard. But they also relied on others. They relied on sharing. They relied on the generosity of this country. I didn't have much that was frivolous when I was growing up. But I always had a roof over my head. And I never worried that I might not. Is this true today? Is this our reality today? Today, our democracy is under threat. We will protect our democracy by creating inclusive cities. We need to rediscover our shared interests. And we need to start with housing. Thank you.